What's going on, you guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Social Wealth Podcast. Today we have an amazing guest, uh, Rob Abasolo. Did I say that correctly, Rob? You did. All right. Now let's say let's see if you can say my YouTube name correctly. Yeah, it's it's uh, Robilt. No, I'm just oh, we, we went over this last time. We spoke, Rob, <laughs> yeah. and gave me a hard time. That's funny. Um, Rob is a, an expert short-term rental investor, tiny home glamping, really creative stuff. Uh, grew a huge following on YouTube and now all different social media platforms. And a lot of awesome things, um, I don't want to steal your thunder, Rob, has, has just kind of come about from that. Was, you're like a perfect guest for this this podcast and what we like to talk about. Um, and also, as of recent, the co-host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, one of, if not the biggest real estate podcast in the world. Um, tons of great info there. So, Rob, welcome to the show. Hello, hello. That's right. I am the titular co-host of the Bigger Pockets podcast. It is the number one, the biggest, the baddest real estate podcast in all of the world. That's how we intro all of our shows. Um, but yeah, it, it's been crazy, man. It's um, everything you just talked about is really just like really nice to reflect on how things have changed, man. You know, I, I put up a really funny little YouTube video. Okay, it wasn't. I, it's funny little YouTube video, as in like it sucked and it was horrible. And I never thought that you know, two and a half years later, I'd be on the Social Wealth Podcast. So it's kind of funny how it all went. Full circle, man. Dream, dream achieved. <laughs> That's so wild. So walk us back. What were you doing before? Because I don't even think I know. What were you doing before YouTube, before real estate? And walk us through like chronologically what, what happened first and led to the, the next, one thing after another. Yeah. So I was a copywriting, uh, uh, a copywriting. Wow. Can we edit this out? Editor. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I was an advertising copywriter at an ad agency. That means that I wrote words for all the ads that you'd ever see, right? So like commercial scripts, I would write word the word the script. Um, never had a commercial made, so I don't know why I even dropped that as an example. But I would also write tweets and Instagram posts for like different brands like Gatorade, Sonic, Old Smoky Moonshine. And then the final brand that I worked on before I quit my nine to five was Hyundai. And so I wrote everything for their social stuff like Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff. So... I'd always had a bit of a marketing edge, if you will, just because I was in advertising and in advertising, you're constantly told that your ideas suck and you suck. And so you kind of develop this like thick skin and, and you're always poking holes in your ideas and seeing what's good and what's bad. And so I think that really helped me uh, when I eventually started my YouTube channel because I was so overly critical on the on the quality because I, I would shoot like really nice, you know, production heavy stuff. And then I looked at my YouTube videos and I was like, it looks nothing like this. Um, so I did that about 10 years. And uh, I started the Raw Built YouTube channel or the Row Built YouTube channel. Let's just confuse everybody at home. Uh, I started that in January of 2020, uh, uh, January 7th. Uh, that was when I uploaded my very first video. And I was still working my full-time job and basically did that for, um, I think, a year, the YouTube well, channel. What was your first video? It was teaching you how to make a floating ledge bookshelf uh, or like sh like just a floating ledge shelf. Uh, and it was really dumb and it was really bad. And it was like on an iPhone and like I used my kitchen light that was just like really dim. I, it's still up there. I don't some people take down their first YouTube videos. I would never do that. I love when people see my terrible videos so that they can be like, whoa, dude, you used to suck. And I'm like, yeah, I know. But look at the glow up, mom. Um, so I still leave all that stuff up there. I actually think it probably has a decent amount of views. So I did that. Um, the raw built channel, funny enough, was a DIY channel primarily when I started and that's what I wanted. I wanted to be like homemade, modern, modern builds, like two of my YouTube heroes. And, you know, I, three or four videos later, I, I posted like a iPhone video of my, uh, touring my tiny house that I built in my backyard. And, uh, that one ended up you know, getting more views than normal, but nothing crazy. And then six months later, I looked at my computer and it was getting like 2000 views an hour. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm going viral. I'm doing it. I've become viral. And so it did. And it kind of, that's when my channel blew up. And I was really bummed because I wanted to be a DIY channel. I wanted to be like those channels I told you about. And turns out no one cared about that. They cared about my tiny house videos and the Airbnb stuff. And I was bummed because at that time, the tiny house content and the real estate content out there was relatively bland and not exciting. And I was like, I don't want to be bland and unexciting. And I told a couple friends and they were like, dude, 
what if you're just not bland and unexciting? What if you just do your version of it? And I was like, that, that's genius. So I kind of like leaned into it, went all in, and that was really the beginning of the Raw Built channel. That's awesome. I, I actually started, totally did not go viral on YouTube myself, but I started in January of 2020. And I wanted to oh, wow. YouTube. I'm like kind of more like personal finance. Like mm -hmm. I really enjoyed like Graham Stephan's channel and, and similar, Me too. similar people. So I was like, man, I would love to just to share some stuff that I'm doing and never had a great YouTube video, to be honest. But um, that's really funny, man. That's awesome. Not yet. Well, yeah. you know, funny enough, six months after my first video, uh, that's when my channel blew up and uh, I became YouTube's creator on the rise. And, you know, things were really starting to work for me. And this is a very long story, so I'm just going to, like, give you the, the, the bullet points. But I, I met this other influencer. She reached out on Instagram, and she was like, I love your tiny house. And I was like, thanks. And we started talking about, like, real estate. She then goes, like, <laughs> she sent me a text later on, and she was like, hey, um, I got this, like, sponsorship with the yacht company with Shelby Church. Would you want to go? And I was like, oh, yeah, let me, let me check my schedule. Yeah. And I was like, oh, yeah, I can go. And uh, – the day that I was going to go, she texted me. And she's like, hey, also Graham Stefan and his girlfriend are coming. Is that cool? And I was like, uh. And my wife was like, is everything okay over there? And I was like, Graham Stefan's going to be on this yacht with me later. And, uh, you know, I had to pretend like I didn't know who he was when I met him. I was like, Graham, oh, you're a YouTuber? That's that's cool. Uh, <laughs> I was totally like just losing it for like four hours on this yacht. That's funny. That's so wild, man. <laughs> yeah, it was really crazy. What a, what a journey. When did it you... Is. Was the, so was the tiny home in your backyard, that was your, was that your first, uh, I guess, toe in the water for anything real estate or for short term rentals specifically or? Uh, not really, but it was my first tiny house that I built. So I moved to LA and I rented this little like apartment. It was 666 square feet. They, they couldn't add a square footage to, you know, add a square foot to change it up a little bit, but 666 uh, square feet, the devil's number, and uh, it was $1,850 a month, and I lived in there for six months, and I was like, I can't bear paying a landlord $1,800 a month to live in this tiny little apartment. I'd rather be poor and own equity in a home than live in this apartment, and my wife was like, well, can we afford it? And I was like, no, we can't afford to live in a house in LA, but we're going to figure it out. So we bought a house in LA for $624,000, which was... <laughs> a mind-blowing amount at that time i mean it is still a lot now but at that time relative to what we were making it was like the scariest thing i'd ever done um and bought that house decided instead of breaking my lease to just list it on because uh, apparently at that time there's this website people would pay you like money to stay at your place and it was uh, this thing called airbnb and so i was like oh yeah i just i'll list my apartment on airbnb and i, I won't pay two thousand dollars to break the lease and so it started popping off immediately. I move into the house that, that I ended up buying, and there was this little 279-square-foot studio apartment underneath. And I had calculated that if, um, if I rented it you know, for 100 bucks a night or something like that, I would make two to $3,000 a month on that little studio apartment, which would subsidize pretty heavily my $4,400 mortgage. And that's exactly what happened. And then my apartment that I was arbitraging at the time, that was making me one to two thousand dollars a month. So I had this like house hack slash first arbitrage apartment going, getting me out of like my mortgage, which was like the biggest financial catalyst for me. It's I attribute all my mi millions of dollars in, in net worth and equity and everything to that decision to be uncomfortable and have people live under my house, right? And then the wheels were turning. I was like, well, what if I bought this? What if I built a tiny house in the backyard? And so my wife was like, well, are you sure you know how to build a tiny house? And I was like, no, definitely not. But I'm going to figure it out. And she's like, all right, you crazy, crazy son of a, can I say bitch? Son of a bitch? Can I say that? Bleep me out, editor. Make me sound good. Yeah, let's, let's bleep it out. Uh, cut this out, but leave this in. All right, anyway, so I was like, yeah, I don't know. Well, let's do it. And so I built this tiny house in my backyard and had no idea what I was doing. Thought it was going to cost 25K and take two weeks and ended up costing 72K and it took me 13 months. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, I built that and uh, Rob built it, if you will. And I hope you will. Uh, and so basically that that was really the beginning of my tiny house journey and everybody loved it and everyone was always very complimentary of it. And I, I, that's kind of when I knew I was onto something. And you listed you that on Airbnb, yeah? 
Uh, initially, no. I rented it to my best friend <laughs> because I told him, I was like, dude, move to L.A. I'm going to build you a tiny house. You can live there super cheap. It'll be done in a month. And he was like, sounds good, bro. So he like quit his job and he like moved to L.A. Oh, <laughs> and he ended up living in our guest room for like 12 months. And then you still have um, the house. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh -huh. nice. Yeah, I bought it for 625. I think it's worth like 1.3 now, which is really nice. Um, so that it, it, that that was a life changing event for me. Right. And, and that's still a life changing number for me. You know, it's a, it's a crazy amount. And it's all because I took a risk and I believed in myself. So um, initially I rented it to him. But then after a while, uh, I got greedy and I was like, time to go. I got to list this thing on Airbnb. I eventually ended up listing it on Airbnb. Then COVID hit right as the channel started. So then I turned it into a medium term rental and really primarily rented that place out 30 days at a time. And that's still what I do now. And you have the, the studio, the main house and the tiny home in the back there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I actually shut down the studio. Um, I could rent it out, but you know, it's my personal home. There's some sentimental value. I make money in other places now. I've got good income, so I don't need income from that third unit anymore. I would prefer to just have less people on my property for the sake of having a controlled home and for the sake of my neighbors and everything like that. Although all my neighbors are Airbnb too. I've inspired them to Airbnb, so no one's mad at me. It's great. So what was the next next investment for you on the real estate side of things. Yeah. So build this tiny house was like, okay, this is working out. Um, I'm going to do it again. So I decided to build it in Joshua tree, California, two and a half hours away. And I was like, I'm going to hire a professional contractor this time. And I'm not going to do any of the work and I'm going to figure out how to get it paid for. So I very creatively financed that one, barely put it together, but I did. And I built it for $165,000 it appraised for two hundred and twenty-two thousand uh, dollars, cashed out at seventy-five percent, and actually got all of my money back in that deal. So I got a free house, and that house went viral for me. That that house completed around the time that my other video started going viral. Then I posted that video, and uh, that was a tour. It was called Casita Conejo. You can go to casitaconejo.com to check it out. And um, basically, I remember I posted that video on YouTube, touring it. And I set it to schedule at 8 a.m. I woke up at 8.30 and it had already gotten like 3,000 views or something. And I like woke my wife up. I was like, babe, babe, I did it. And she's like, what? And I was like, I've gone viral again. I am a YouTube god. And so basically um, that video ended up getting like, I don't know, 800,000 views or something like that. But it was crazy Shut because like, like I was just so blown away that things were starting to click. And I was really excited to lean into the Airbnb thing. And so... I built that tiny house. Then I built another tiny house a couple minutes away from it called Casa uh, Mariposa. And it, was, it wasn't it was tiny. It was like 800 square feet. So we say it's a small home. Um, and that house also went viral too. And that was making pretty good income on Airbnb. And funny enough, my Airbnb, the, the, the tiny house in Joshua Tree, the first one that I built, that one was really crazy because the first year it grossed like $78,000 or something like that. And the profit on it was like, four or $5,000 a month. And so again, life-changing money for me at the time because I was a copywriter and I was making $110,000 at my job. So it wasn't nothing, but I had student loans and I had you know other expenses and stuff like that. And my wife was making at that point like 75K. So you know we were doing okay. We we're making about 185, but we're living in LA, right? Gas is three, $4 a, a gallon. Everything's more expensive. And we just didn't have like a ton left over, but we were starting to get comfortable. But it was really cool that Airbnb, like we were making thousands of dollars. And so if we wanted to take a trip, we could do that, right? Um, but I was pretty cheap and frugal and I'd always do my best to reinvest my profits into that next project. And so I did that over and over and over again. Um, and I, this is something that I really believe in, right? Like the thing with Airbnb and me as a creator in the space, um, yeah, I want to inspire people. I want to inspire people to start an Airbnb business and quit their nine to five job. Michael, I'm sure you can, you know, um, relate to this, but at the same time, I'm such a big advocate of living like you're poor for as long as you can. Like I made all this, you know, all the money that I've made on Airbnb, I would say I have spent one or 2% of it. I have ne that money has always stayed in their proper bank accounts. 
I've transferred them over to other investments. I have never pulled from my real estate portfolio a single time. And I believe if you can do that for many years and be super disciplined and keep your nine to five job for as long as you possibly can, it will make you a millionaire eventually. And that's kind of how it worked out for me. Yeah. And probably sooner rather than later. I mean, I think like a lot of people like yourself happened for me, Elliot, once you get that first property, like becoming a millionaire, having 10 or 20,000 plus a month in cash flow seems so far fetched, but the compounding effect is real. Um, and things can really just start to snowball. Um, and, and I've worked with so many people that it has happened to, uh, as well. And I know Elliot can attest for that. I remember talking with him for the first time, I think in 2020, um, he reached out to me just as a former uh, baseball player himself. And he's like, Hey, I'm interested in short-term rentals. So chatted with him, did some coaching calls. And then Elliot reaches out to me a year later. He's like, Hey, I got six properties now. I'm making all this money. I'm like, what happened? This is, <laughs> you know, but it's yeah. just like, it's so cool to see how quickly things can really snowball once you just take that first step. And I think that's what peop most people struggle with in any line of, of business or, or, or real estate investment, whatever it be. Um, it's just that first step that mm -hmm. really haunts people. Well, it's funny too that you say that about Elliot because you know, I've got a decent amount of students in, in host camp, my, my Airbnb mentorship program. And it's a very bittersweet thing to be an educator because I'm training my competition. I'm training them on all the mistakes I ever made and I'm teaching them not to do it. And they're better than me. They're smarter than me. They make a lot more money than me on Airbnb. And uh, it's bittersweet because like, I love to see it. And I'm also like, dang it, I'm a nobody. But that's sort of how it works, right? Like you, the idea is to like, teach people and help them become better than you so that, you know, like your success sort of has a little bit of a legacy across the industry. Yeah. And I think it's one thing to be really good at something, but it takes an, an additional layer of skills to be able to teach, portray and educate and make somebody else an expert as well. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot to be said for that and what you've done with host camp. Um, and any educator out there too is, you know, helping people build a business, uh, build a social media brand. Um, it takes a real expert to be able to help make other people experts. It's true, man. Teaching is not easy. I mean, there are so many operators in the Airbnb world that are way better than me. You know what I mean? I'm pretty good at Airbnb. Uh, am I the best in the world? No, of course not. But I think I'm the best in the world at teaching it, maybe. Like, I think I could have a, a, con a, a, a I could contend on that. Uh, maybe after you, you know, maybe you and me go hand in hand on that one, right? But, you know, it's hard to do that. And my YouTube channel is free content. All I do, all I care about in life is making a good YouTube video that inspires somebody to take the first step, take action, get into Airbnb, right? And I've done it for two and a half years. So it's always kind of funny to me that I can pour my heart and life and soul into this and teaching people and have 1400 students and growing. I mean, you know, and I think it's actually 1500 now and do so much and see the effects that I have on people. And I can see their portfolios grow. And I'll talk to a student, like you said, and in like a year later, they've got like 15 or they have more than me and they've scaled up and I see it. I see the tangible effects of teaching. And yet there's still always going to be this like population of people that hate me <laughs> for doing it, hate me for teaching, hate me, for monetizing my my knowledge um that this is always a weird thing for me because people are like oh you just sell courses like you're a guru like scam artist i'm like why i also give the free stuff away on youtube just watch that and it's always funny because it's the same people that comment on my channels and stuff and i'm like you watch all the free content and you learn from it what are you mad about are you mad like i, I don't i really don't understand it man the taboo around education and courses like i'll never understand it because it can be a life-changing thing to people that actually put everything they have into making their minds smarter. So let's get into that. So, you know, the purpose of the social wealth podcast is taking what you've done on social media and then monetizing it and explaining that. So take us back to, you know, creating host camp and the ideas behind that and why you did it and how you did it and to get to where you're, you said 1500 students. Yeah. Is that yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, all right. So around, <sighs> probably month six when the channel starts exploding um i decided why not like i had so many people reaching out for free advice and at first it was very flattering right i was like oh yeah sure i'll help you hey do you have a quick time for a zoom call hey i'd love to go to coffee and pick your brain and 
basically have your emotional uh, well-being and your experience whittled down to like a $3 coffee, right? And I was like, okay, I don't think I can do this anymore, you know? So I decided I'm going to start just charging for a consultation. And so I started charging um, $150 an hour to people that wanted to just book an hour of my time. And it was kind of crazy. Like people were booking me for $150 an hour. And if you extrapolate $150 an hour for like a full-time year, that's like 300K a year, right? So it's kind of crazy to think like I was able to potentially make that much money, right? So I started filling up my calendar and basically this was during the pandemic. So I was working from home. So I would take calls like at noon and then at five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven PM at night. And then I would my latest one would end at midnight. And so I did that for probably like, oh, I don't know, several, many, many months. And then the money was good because it was like starting to stack up, right? You do $150 an hour five times a day for a week. It's like, holy crap, like I got I got money, guys. I can I can buy a pair of shoes. It's like I did it. And so um, I could get Adidas Ultra Boost. They're like $180, man. Like, I don't even, I don't even have to worry about it. Um, and so I, I, it's very topical. I just bought some Adidas Ultra Boost yesterday. And, uh, and I've arrived because I didn't care how much it cost. But anyways, um, so I was charging $150 an hour. And, you know, I did start to kind of feel this grind. I was like, man, uh, this, is, this is taxing, right? It's taxing to, like, effectively perform for an hour at a time and give in like the same answers to the same questions every hour of the day. Right. And so I was like, all right, well, I got to make this worth it for me. And I actually ended up consulting a consultant and he was like, Hey man, just wanted to want you to know this is way too cheap. And you know, if you're booked a hundred percent of the time, that means that you're too, you're too cheap. You're too cheap. You need to raise up your prices so that you're only booked six to 60 to 70% of the time. Need some dynamic uh, pricing for. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So I hooked up with price labs. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. So, um, so basically I raised my price to $200 an hour and booking slowed down. Right. And then they, I got booked out a month in advance and then I raised it to 300 and then 400 and then 500. And okay, now the money's like, all right, that's pretty good. I think this is not too bad, right? Five hundred bucks an hour, five times a, a day. You know, it's twenty five hundred bucks a day. That's pretty. That's pretty significant. It's a million dollars a year, uh, forty hours a week, right? But with all that said, um, I actually had a student. No, well, okay, actually, no, he wasn't a student. I had a consulting client book me, and you know, I did my thing, and he felt like his mind was shattered and he's like man dude this is amazing he's like have you ever thought about doing a course and i was like no what, what do you mean he's like dude i bought this course uh, it's a guy named brian page he charges like two thousand dollars for his course he's like i think you could do that man i think you could do your own version of it and if you make the raw built version of it it would be really good and i was like kind of just like almost offended that I could that he said I could charge two thousand dollars for this. I was like, dude, shut up! But thank you, I love you. But shut up, you know. So whatever. He kind of like incep inception to me. His name was Michael Wynn. I'll never forget him, because from that moment on, I was kind of like, oh, you know, I was just like, this is kind of crazy, right? Because I'm doing these consultations, and then they're like, how do I find a good piece of land? What about power? What about septic? What about this? What if a guest calls you in the middle of the night? And then I was just kind of like getting asked these questions over and over again. I was like, what if I made a $2,000 course, you know? So I was sort of just kind of in the motions of all this. Then I get this email from a subscriber. Um, his name is Dylan. And um, he emails me and he says, hey, man, I'm kind of interested in investing with you. I know that you take investments from people. And then he's like, hey, by the way, um, side note, I think that your channel and your content is one of a kind. I don't think anybody does what you do. He's like, there's no reason why you shouldn't be making seven figures a year selling your knowledge. He's like, and if you don't believe me, I've actually sold $15 million of my own Amazon course. He's like, so, you know, I think you could do it. So I was like, okay, I'm cool. You know, I, I, I responded something long and he kind of ghosted me and I was like, cool. Thanks, bro. So anyways, uh, I'm doing this con consulting thing and I've opened the computer and the guy is there and I'm like, hey, what can I do for you? And he's like, oh, hey, 
uh, I'm, I'm Dylan. I'm the guy that sent you the email about your course and making seven figures. He's like, you know, I figured the only way I could get in front of your face was booking you. And I was like, you paid $300 to talk to me right now? Like to tell me to make a course? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, okay. So I kind of refunded him. And he ended up just sort of breaking down the world of courses to me and really just walked me through it. And it asked for nothing in return. He just wanted to help me. And that guy really changed my life. I mean, he, he's a mentor of mine to this day. Uh, so Dylan Frost, if you're listening, thank you very much. But it was just kind of crazy because I knew nothing about this. And he was like, really just kind of coaching me for it. it. Had he said, hey, I'll give you like, all this advice for, you know, for if you just give me like 10% of your sales, I would have been like, sure. And that would have cost me, you know, over time, millions of dollars. And he didn't want any of that. Right. So it's kind of funny. And so I decided to launch my first course. It's called Glamp Camp. Um, I decided to launch sort of this six week boot camp where I teach people how to start a glamping business, you know, how to put a tent out in the desert or an Airstream out on land and basically how to monetize that for the purposes of Airbnb. And I was really scared, man. I'll be honest. I was at first. I was like, "All right, well, if these guys think I can charge five hundred dollars an hour, or five hundred dollars, or sorry, two thousand dollars for a course, I'm going to sell it for five hundred because that seems nice and reasonable." And just as I got closer to it, I was like, "You know what? I'll do a thousand. Yeah, you know what? I'll do fifteen hundred. You know what? I'll do, I'll do two thousand because I was like, really trying to figure out <clears throat> what the knowledge was worth for somebody if they actually implemented my strategies and they actually did what I said, how much money could they make? And the way it kind of worked out was like, I think if someone just does a basic glamping listing, they can make $2,000 a month or $24,000 a year. I think it's reasonable to say what I'm about to teach you is worth 2000 bucks. It's actually worth 24000 in my opinion, but 2000 seems fair. So I was really scared to put it out there and I was scared of like, the backlash that I'd get from my community and like, you know, cause you, you put the price out there and you're always scared that someone's going to comment on your channel and say like, Whoa, just another sleazy guy charging $2,000 and this and that, you know, I got two of those comments. Um, and that's it on that first launch. Like that series that I made on YouTube got like a million views over the three or four videos that I made and nobody was mad. You know, a lot of people signed up. I think my first cohort, I signed up like, 300 people in the first week and in the week launch that I did. And guys, this was, this broke me both emotionally and figuratively. And like, I was just like made five times my salary in seven days. And it, you wake, I was you just wake your wife up and tell her you've gone viral. <laughs> it was, um, so the well, you know, viral baby, <laughs> the, the bank's gone viral. I love that. That's funny. I got to use that. Somewhere. I'm building um, you a bigger, tiny home. Um, but it was oh. it was crazy because yeah, I mean, I was refreshing my Stripe account and I was like, babe, <laughs> like this is crazy. And it was so stupid that we didn't even like believe it. Like it did, it was like at that moment, if you had handed me $10,000 in a bag, that was going to be more digestible and believable and more impactful than like half a million dollars because half it was just so out, it, it was crazy, right? But 10,000, I'd be like, oh my God, you really changed my life. But just seeing it go to like half a million in a week, I was like, I don't even, I don't know. This is, what, what, I, what is this? I don't even understand it. And it's still kind of, that's kind of how money is for me these days. Like, I just have never really kind of come to terms with, with money. It's like a very weird thing. So, you know, it, it's one of those things I'm very grateful for. And I try to give back as much as I can or whatever, um, especially like paying it forward to my students and, free education because ultimately like my audience helped do this for me. Right. And so that was the first course that I ever launched. It was massively successful. And, um, you know, I got a lot of good feedback from my students. A lot of them launched their glamp sites and it was really cool to see. Uh, and that was in April of 2021, I think. And that's actually when I quit my full-time job. Um, I actually yeah, quit I think. <laughs> my, no, no, I quit my job a week before the launch and I told my wife, I was like, I got to quit. And she was like, okay, that's fine. And I, I like quit the job and I cried at like a little baby. And my bosses are like, are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I just, I'm quitting. And they're like, oh, okay. Thank God. Stop crying. And I was like, I'm sorry. I just, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. And they're like, are you going to be okay? Like financially? And I was like, yeah, I make way more money doing everything else than this job. And they're like, then you're going to be fine, man. 
you should have quit a long time ago because they all watch my channel and they knew how much I made and stuff from Airbnb. Um, so basically, like, I, I launched that first one and I didn't close off my um, my consulting calendar at that time. I left it open for all of April because I was scared. I didn't know, like, how the course was going to pan out. I was actually going to – my goal was 50K. I was like, if I make 50K, I'm going to be really good to go. But I'm just going to keep my consulting calendar up just in case. If I can make, you know, 2K a week, I'll be great. And – course sales start popping off like in the first couple of days and i'm like oh sh oh my god i gotta close my consulting calendar but i was booked out a month in advance and that next month was probably the hardest month of my life because i was dealing with the fulfillment of my course and doing all that and the emotions of being wealthy ish for the first time and then then i was like consulting somebody for 500 dollars an hour you know making relative peanuts to what I was making right and I was just like why didn't I believe in myself you know I was so angry at myself that I sold all my time I made decent money I couldn't even enjoy it I was stuck to my computer every hour of the day for like a month and then I got out of April course is basically done and I was like I can breathe you know and I can focus on the channel again and I bought enough money to like reinvest in new equipment and all this kind of stuff um and then fast forward to a couple months later I, I launched host camp my Airbnb mentorship program that teaches the fundamentals of an Airbnb program, uh, or Airbnb business. I actually don't even know why I didn't launch that one first, but the glamping thing, I was just really good at it at the time. And so I ended up launching host camp. And then that was also massively successful for me too. And that was also a one week launch. Um, and then I relaunched it a couple of months after that. And again, massively successful. So it's been kind of just this weird thing where um, I've become this educator in the space um, it's a really good program. I see people doing it and I'm just trying to keep up with d demand and trying to be a content creator and a businessman and an entrepreneur and an Airbnb operator and a family man and a dad and a, you know, and a husband and all that kind of stuff. So it's been kind of crazy ba balancing it all, but it, it's kind of working now, I think. That's awesome. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty crazy. And I think it's all like hindsight because you and I have spoke, Rob, I've spoken to Elliot about this too. When I first launched my own coaching, I was I had no expectations, right? And I think I was so heads down that I didn't do the research or network to understand how to build like a really successful coaching business, which I've invested a lot of money recently into learn learning how to do that. Um, yeah, I remember looking back and I was like, I started doing the same thing, 100 bucks an hour for coaching, 200, 500, then a little course here. And I, Rob told me I was giving it away for free, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. like a year you ago. Were. Yeah, I, you under, were. I undervalued it. I think myself, I'm like, yeah, I don't know if someone will pay for this, but then I would have people like Elliot, you know, he launched his first property. I think he paid me like, I gave him a discount because he's a baseball player. Um, I gave it to him for like 350 bucks. My original video course, which is <laughs> A to Z, like all the things that I do is short term rentals. And he sends me a text. He's like, Hey man, I just cash flowed like $12,000 my first month up on Airbnb. Oh know. my God. That's the, amazing. The best return that's amazing. Like you're best like ROI I've ever had. That's what I want. But I mean, the ROI on the program, I was like, maybe I should charge like a little more. So I upped it a little bit and you know, it's just crazy how things evolve. But um, yeah, what a wild world. What do you, what, what about YouTube though? I mean, do you, do you make much through, through ads there? Yeah. 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 I did. Okay. I do. Okay. There. So let me pull it up here, but I think I typically make on YouTube and I honestly, at this point, you know, my goal for YouTube is to make it break even. Like that's all I really care about. Cause I have an editor and I pay him a pretty, you know, a decent amount, you know? So for me, I'm not really looking to cash in on YouTube because it's sort of one of those things where I make, Ooh, actually more than I thought. Um, hmm. okay. Sorry. I'll get, I'll get to that in a second. Sorry. Spoiler alert. But basically, um, I don't really care if I make money or not on YouTube because it's the top of my funnel, right? So I give the free content away, but I also give away free resources that are downloadable resources. And in exchange, people give me their email and they get onto my email list and then they get onto my drip sequence and then they get onto my updates. And then, you know, I say, hey, book a call with my team. And then I monetize through the free information that I get, right? So that's like, I, I make much more money from my other businesses than from YouTube. So for 2022, um, it says that I made a hundred and fifty three thousand 
five hundred and one dollars. Um, not bad for for twenty twenty two. So that's actually a lot more than I thought. I thought I made probably like one hundred and ten. So I make about one hundred and fifty three thousand dollars there. But one my my good friend told me one time that if the most money you make on YouTube is from AdSense, you're doing something wrong. And I always took that to heart. So between YouTube and affiliates uh, and like Airbnb used to give me like a really good affiliate back in the day. Um, you know, I probably make like 750 K a year from YouTube and just affiliates. So that's pretty good. Yeah, that's great. Not say. even including course sales. Right. So I'm happy with, with that. Um, and then about 150 K are my expenses to run the YouTube channel, but that's for now. Like, I'm going to be, I just hired two more editors. I'm going to hire a social media person. I just hired a copywriter. I'm hiring like a shorts editor. Yeah. So I'm looking to basically 10 X my team so that I can have a full time sort of living, breathing channel where content's going up all the time. And uh, what's the team behind you at base camp? Uh, host camp. Um, Sorry, host that, camp. It's, uh, all good. All good. Um, so that's my COO Jim. And that's really it, man. I mean, we're a pretty scrappy team. I mean, I got my COO who sort of runs the fulfillment side. And then I've got probably like, you know, 10, 10 or so people on the sales team um, that kind of help get people onboarded into the program and everything like that. Uh, and that's pretty much it, man. We're, we're a very small, small team, but um, just actually interviewed someone today that I'm bringing on for back end kind of technical stuff. So yeah, I mean, I'm trying to keep it small, but I'm starting to realize that I, I mean, I've realized this a long time ago, but I'm taking action towards it. I do too much. And so I'm just trying to hire everybody to kind of like take over my roles, but I'm just bad at it at hiring people because I'm really stubborn. And I'm always like, no one's going to do it better than me kind of thing. Cause I, no one knows me the way I know me, but it's a very stubborn viewpoint that I'm fighting every day. Yeah. I sympathize with that. It's, um, it's challenging. And I don't know about you, but for me, like I can see why entrepreneurs, you know, talk about the difficulties of actually starting a business because it, you have to spend so much time figuring out shit. Like it takes so much time to like learn how to use, like what tech stack do I use? How, what employee mm -hmm. do I hire first? How do I teach them? How do I make it so they don't come to me every day asking the same questions? So there's so much that goes into it. It can be exhausting. Um, when I started making hires a few months ago, I was waking up at like five in the morning to consume content from a course I purchased so I can go implement. And then I spent the next like 12 hours implementing it. So, but the whole point was to get time back. So that's cool to see that you're, you know, hiring and, and outsourcing a bunch. What is the ultimate, do you have an ultimate goal or instead of like a end goal, like a, a state of being, you and I talked about this recently on a mm -hmm. FaceTime, Rob, but. Um, getting that time freedom back because that's kind of ultimately what a lot of people who get into real estate or investing or building a business um, you want that time control so what is what does that state of being look like for you and and when do you hope to i guess to be there i don't know man i mean this is really hard for me because i say this the genuinely as as humbly as possible um i mean i don't know I'm trying to figure out if it's even an arrogant thing to say. I don't know. You guys tell me. All of my dreams have come true. <laughs> Everyone. Dreams that I didn't even dream came true. Like, you know, um, I grew a really crazy – I have the number one Airbnb channel in the world <laughs> on YouTube. Um, I am one of the biggest Airbnb influencers <laughs> in the world. Um, I shot a documentary, uh, like a social documentary with PBS. I shot a pilot with with HGTV. I got a call from Bigger Pockets, the biggest real estate podcast in the world, to be the co-host for the show. Um, my big goal was to make a million dollars, and I've superseded that many times over in a year. So I don't know what else I want, man. And it's it's like a good and a bad thing because it it's hard to figure out what's next when you hit your next several times already. So I always have to like kind of go back and, and like, I've been trying to think of like impossible goals that I can't hit so that I have something to, to work towards because I guess at this point, anything is possible, but I wouldn't really say it's anything 
monetary, I would like to figure out how to make a million dollars a month. Um, that's kind of a goal. It's stupid only because like, what do you do with a million dollars a month? Like, I don't know. I feel like you get to a certain point. I I guess so. You can buy more Adidas. I could buy so many Adidas. Um, I don't know. Like I make good money now and it just sits in the bank account. I, I buy things here and there. I have a couple of splurges that I invest in these days, but like, what are those? I don't know. Uh, watches. I'm a big watch guy You're now. Watch guy. Yeah. It's, it's the new influencer thing, I guess. I like Rolexes. Rob told but... me I was lame because I don't have a Rolex. <laughs> you don't have a Rolex, but it's because, look. What car do you want, Rob? Well, I have an Audi e-tron GT, which was kind of a dream car. Um, but then I drive it around, and I'm like, eh, it's cool, but, like, it's, I don't know. It's not that cool. Like, I was like, it, it does. It's, it's, like, uncomfortable to get into, and, like, it's small so i actually just got uh this my pre-order shit. <laughs> yeah this little <laughs> janky hundred and twenty thousand dollar car um but then i also got like a, a just now i ordered my like three days ago a ford lightning platinum which that. is like freaking awesome i'm excited for it um i actually have been super amped for the cyber truck but actually i think i'm not anymore because the ford lightning is like freaking awesome so i got that i don't know i I don't know if it'll bring me happiness yet. I doubt it. But honestly, at this point, <laughs> this sounds so materialistic. The only thing that brings me happiness from a materialistic standpoint are Rolexes. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> Rolexes are hard to get, okay? And I think this kind of goes into the whole, like, my goals have changed and everything. Or, like, I don't have goals or I want impossible goals. You can't just walk into a store and get a Rolex. Did y'all know this? No. Vaguely. Okay. Okay. So you go I've into a store. I've also never gone into a store looking for a Rolex. So. Okay. Well, if you ever go in and you say, hey, I want a Rolex, I'll be like, cool. Uh, give us your name and your number. And if we think you're cool, we might call you in like five years. So there's a little bit of a hunt to it, right? You got to go in and establish, you know, contact and like build a relationship with an AD, an authorized dealer. And then, you know, you talk to them, you go in, you visit, and you you genuinely try to develop a relationship, and they may or may not call you. But when you get a call from the AD, it's like the happiest day ever because you're like, oh, my gosh, like, I did it. I'm part of the club. Like, I've done it. Because it's basically one of those things where I have to really work for it. And it's like a challenge, and it's like a fun challenge. So I think that's really more about it than, than actually the actual watch itself. It's like even when you have what you resources and everything like that still ain't going to get you on the top of the list of a rolex you know what i mean have you flipped a rolex yet no i would never, never. i would never i'm yeah, sorry yeah. for the insult it is insult <laughs> it, those are the pro those people are the problem and that's yeah. why it's so hard to get a freaking rolex i thought about it because uh, it's like a, i hear this in the bourbon industry where you're like you know like bur- hard to find bourbon super expensive and they flip it on the second also market, you know, part of the collection. problem also part of the problem, I just want Eagle Rare, which is a $35 bourbon or a $35 whiskey, but all the freaking liquor stores around here upcharge mm-hmm. it to $90, and it's mm-hmm. frustrating. Yeah. So, Elliot, don't, don't be that guy. Yeah, but no. basically, but never. Uh, Rolexes are a legitimate investment. If you buy it from an AD, it's typically like worth double. So, yeah. you know, I've got, I've got equity in my watches, so I do genuinely consider them investments. Kevin O'Leary would agree. That's right. Yeah, I like yeah. Kevin. Yeah. Good friend. Good friend. Just kidding. About to say what? <laughs> well, I met Kevin on his yacht one day. I got a call. <laughs> you know, at this point, I think it is possible. That's actually a good goal to have a collab with Kevin O'Leary. Like, I love that guy. I watch his videos. When his clips and his TikTok show up on my channel, I'm always like, let's watch it. Because he's kind of a dork. Um, and he, like, knows it, but he also doesn't. And he's also brilliant. And I'm just like, I like this guy. I just want to hang out with him. So I actually think it's within reason to do a collab with him. But, um, all Kevin, to say, I think Kevin, if you're watching yeah, <laughs> or listening, great. yeah, um, I think He's coming it, on the show next week, we'll, we'll get you in. T- we'll get you in touch with Rob. Elt. Okay, I actually have a list of goals here. If you guys, uh, maybe Michael, Michael, if you if this is an answer to your question, all right, um, get on the hot ones. That yeah, seems that impossible. Be, that would be okay? so funny. I could see you on the hot ones. I'd have to be way more famous than I am now, which is not, right? Like, I'd have to be some level of notoriety, so that's something to work towards. Like, David Dobrik level, basically, which, again, won't happen, but, hey, it gives me something. Uh, get on an AD tour, you know, Architectural Digest, how they do tours of, like, celebrity homes and stuff. 
That'd be dope. Go- that's a goal for mine. Again, not really feasible because I'd have to be a celebrity, but okay, whatever. Uh, get a million subs on YouTube. Where are you that's, at now? Uh, 237,000. Uh, get a John Mayer Daytona, which is like the rarest of Rolexes. Uh, get John Mayer to call me back. Oh, yeah, that's, you know, just to become friends with John Mayer. Uh, build, build a pirate Airbnb with Peter McKinnon. Uh, he's a YouTuber. I don't know why I have that written in there, but that would be really cool. <laughs> um, make $10 million a year. Close to the million dollar goal that I talked about. Own John Wick's car. I just saw John Wick and his car was cool. I was like, yeah, maybe I'll own one of those one day. Like 250000 There you go, Elliot. That answers your question. Lose 20 pounds. Easy. I probably should have started with that one. Start a podcast. Uh, own a George Kondo painting, my favorite artist. Read 10 books. <laughs> really just spanning the... Like ever the, or a year? Like, what's the timeline? <laughs> like, it, yeah, in a year. In a year. I don't read a lot. I haven't read a book in like four years. And there you have it. Those are the goals. Once I reach all that, Michael, then I think I'll probably be depressed because I'm like, then now what? Now what is there to do? I don't know. What about fam- family stuff? What goals do you have with your family? <sighs> I want to travel a lot more. My kids are very young. They're one and a half and, th- and three. And that's a very bad age for airplanes. So uh, we you, don't boy, travel. Boy, girls. Boy and a girl. Call me. I got yeah. the same thing. I got a three-year-old boy and a one-year-old boy. Oh, nice, man. Well, yeah. congratulations. Uh, I, I agree with you. Tri- the planes are awful. It's tough, man. And I just got on yeah. a plane with my son, and he was throwing a tantrum the entire time. And it was really bad. It was a really, really, really bad experience. And you feel so, bad for everybody around you. And... Yes, he was slapping the lady yeah. next to me, <laughs> knocking her water everywhere. It was. I mean, I had to literally hold him down with both my arms for an hour and a half. It was crazy. Um, but it's it's a, one of those things where I'm like, my like I had never traveled. And then before, like, as soon as I started my Airbnb business, my wife was like, hey, we should have to think about having kids. I was like, all right, before we have kids, let's travel to 10 countries. And she's like, let's do it. So we traveled to 10 countries in a year. And then we had a kid, right? So going to those 10 countries were the first time that I had traveled. And it really changed me. And I was like, oh, my gosh, this, I wish I wasn't broke. Like, I wish I could enjoy this and, like, splurge and stuff. And so now I finally have the money to travel and live the dreams. But I, we can't get on a plane with kids for 12 hours. It's just not yeah. something we can do at this particular juncture. All right. I think that's a good time to, we're coming up on our 45 minute mark here or we're at 47 minutes actually. Oh, dang. So we're let's over. end the podcast with the question. And, and thank you, man, for coming on. Um, out of those 10 countries, which one was your favorite? Copenhagen. No Ooh. doubt. Uh, that's in, that's in Denmark. Why? Yeah. Uh, architecture is just absolutely cool. Like all of the bars and pubs and stuff are all these like little janky kind of hole in the walls. They're inc- incredibly bike friendly. Their museums are really cool. The f- they have this like th- my favorite place on earth. It's called the Louisiana. It's this like um, crazy contemporary art museum that's like an hour and a half outside of the city, and you have to go like on a really fast train to get there and all this stuff. It's just an adventure, man. Like it's like a completely different experienced in the united states and uh i don't know it's just like i wish i could live there but it's not practical but i would like to at least go there a couple times a year if i could or, or own an airbnb there that would be cool just go build a tiny house over there no yeah, well all dude in europe everything is tiny so yeah that, that could be done pretty easily you can build a pirate bnb over in denmark <laughs> with peter mckinnon yeah you never know yeah, yeah. so peter, peter if you're listening if you're hit, hit me up peter, <laughs> peter and kinnon if you, peter and uh kevin hit me up yeah that's well Rob, thanks for coming on. I think we could talk for probably another three hours. Maybe we should yeah. lengthen the podcast, Elliot. I don't know, because there's so yeah. much to cover, man. But yeah, man. Um, just the tip of the iceberg. Doing. Yeah, keep keep inspiring people. You've obviously helped a ton of people, uh, more than just the 1,500 that you've coached personally, but um, everyone that you've reached through social media. Like, it's a powerful tool. Um, so keep, keep, doing, keep doing it, man. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, have me on uh, for a part two. How about that? Have I was me just on. thinking about that. I need a part two yeah. in like six months. Yeah, when you have a guest that like cancels on you last second or something like that, just text me and be like, yeah, you want to jump on really fast? Count me in. You got it. We'll plan on it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening.